Biznology Digital Marketing Webinar. I'm Frank Reed, and I'm one of the bloggers here at Biznology. I'm also the managing editor of Marketing Pilgrim, which is um, on the ad age for number 10 in Power 150, and I also consult with local businesses in my business, uh, Local Basics. So make sure that you check me out uh, on Frank Fridays at the Biznology blog, please. Today you'll be hearing from Mike Moran, the managing editor of the Biznology blog, who will present Digital Marketing is Direct Marketing. And as we're waiting for more attendees to join, let me review the format of our webinar. Our Biznology webinars just, uh, last just 30 minutes, so you can easily fit them into your busy schedule. Uh, we record each webinar, and we'll email you that link later this week. During our speaker's presentation, you can use your GoToWebinar control to ask a question, and we certainly encourage you to do that. That orange arrow opens and closes your webinar controls. In the audio section, you can select and test your audio setting. If you have any questions, simply type it into the question box at any time during the event and press the send button. I'll select a few questions at the end of the webinar and pose them to Mike. So um, while we're waiting for the last attendees to, to uh, join us here, I'd like to remind you that the Biznology newsletter and blog is available for free at MikeMoran.com. So if you're not already a subscriber, we hope that you'll sign up now. Thanks again uh, to all of you for spending 30 minutes with us. We know how valuable your time is, so let's introduce today's speaker. Uh, Mike Moran is the managing editor of the Biznology blog and a well-known expert in all things digital marketing. Mike is the co-author of Search Engine Marketing, Inc., and the sole author of Do It Wrong Quickly, two books that cover in-depth the topic that he'll cover today, applying direct marketing principles to digital marketing. Mike is a veteran of IBM managing groups in IBM.com for eight years and retiring from IBM in 2005 as a distinguished engineer. Mike has a thriving private consulting practice and also serves as chief strategist at Conversion, a leading digital marketing agency. So if you've ever struggled with how to know the value of digital marketing or how to tell if anything you're doing is working, this is the webinar for you. So Mike, take it away. Thanks a lot, Frank. And welcome, everybody. So let's start at the beginning. So Let's figure out first what direct marketing is. Most of you probably have at least some experience with direct marketing, even if it's only because you got a catalog or a direct mail letter in your mailbox. But let's think about it from the other side. Let's think about it from the marketing side. So what happens if you're in charge of that catalog and you go to the boss and say, I shipped February's catalog on time, under budget, customers like it, and it looks beautiful. Want to see it? You know what the boss says? You're fired. And why does the boss talk to you that way? Well, it's because that's not what the boss is interested in. That didn't answer any of the boss's questions. What the boss wants to know is which products sold better month over month? Which are the ones that we changed the pictures for? And did they sell better or worse? Which are the ones we should drop out of the catalog for next month? In fact, every question the boss has is about sales. It's about response. A lot of times they call direct marketing direct response. That's why. But suppose I said to you, we finished the site redesign on time and under budget. Customers like it. And it looks beautiful. Want a demo? That doesn't sound as funny anymore. Often we treat our websites like they're some kind of technological tour de force. The fact that we just finished the project, the website is up, and it's different than it used to be, we're done. Actually, that's when the job starts. Just like with the catalog, the job isn't to produce the catalog, the job is to get sales from the catalog. And similarly, when we look at online marketing, any kind of digital marketing, the job isn't to produce the marketing, the job is to make money from it. And that's what we want to figure out how to do today. So direct marketing, direct response, conversion marketing, all of these things are synonyms for the same thing. And what we want to do today is to look at what the lessons are of direct marketing so that we understand how to apply those lessons to the web, to social media, to anything digital. All of the things you know about direct marketing apply. So let's first look at the direct marketing process. So if you look at these steps, they may not seem familiar to you because these are not the steps that you might typically take in order to put together any kind of digital marketing. The first step might be the one that's the strangest. 
measure. You might ask yourself, well, how can I measure something when I haven't done it yet? Well, the thing that direct marketers know is the very first place that they start is with understanding what they want the results to be. So they begin the process by defining exactly what they want to happen. So for example, if you're redesigning your website, what do you want to happen after that? Do you want more visitors to come? Do you want more people to click a certain button on the site? What is it that you're expecting to happen numerically? What is the objective data that you expect to change about your website after it's redesigned? Or if you're putting a video out on YouTube, how many views do you expect to get? How many of those people do you expect to click through with, to your site? How many of those people do you expect to buy something? Those are the kinds of questions you have to ask yourself. So it starts with measurement. It starts with goals and objectives. Then what you have to do is experiment. You have to try different things. Now, I know that when you get one of those credit card letters in your mailbox, it looks like the company wrote one letter and mailed it to everybody. But that's not what they did. They actually wrote a hundred letters and sent it to a thousand people each to see which ones came back with the best results. And the reason they do that is because it costs just as much to send a crappy letter as it does to send a good letter. So you might as well send the one that's going to get the best response. So they test many different things before they decide to send out that letter to the million people on the list. Then what happens is even after they think they've got something working, so with that catalog example, they may know what their flagship product is. They have that, those roses on the front cover of that catalog, and those are their best sellers, and that's great. But every month they keep checking. What was the, what was the response on the roses? What was it that we were getting back? Is anything starting to fall off? Maybe the picture is getting a little dated. Maybe the copy isn't reaching people the way it used to. Maybe our prices are higher than our competitors now, and we didn't realize that. They're constantly monitoring performance even after they think they have something that's working. So when you think about direct marketing, you automatically have to think about numbers. So you have to think about the difference between direct mail and catalog. They may look very different, so the elements that go into them are different, but most of what happens in direct marketing is the same. You have to segment your mailing list. There's all sorts of factors that you use to decide who you're mailing it to. You need a consistent and persuasive message to get people to do something, not just to learn about your products. You do all that testing that we talked about, and then you figure out what your response rate is. Now, the conversion rates for direct mail are low, but it's okay because the costs are too. And all of those factors can be applied to search marketing, can be applied to web marketing, can be applied to any kind of digital marketing. So the example here we give is for search marketing. So the elements of what you're putting together is different. So you're putting together a website, you're putting together keyword lists, all those are different, but the message, the testing, the response, the fact that you're doing all those things, those are all the same. So I put in blue all the things that are the same between search marketing and between um, catalog marketing and direct mail. Much of the process is exactly the same, or at least it should be. So let's think about what we're trying to pay attention to here. So a conversion is something that indicates that you made a sale. So if you think about how this works in offline marketing, so don't think digital yet. Let's think about how this works in life with a sales force. You have some prospects. These are people that are not customers yet, but you're hoping they'll become customers. Then you see how many customers you get out the back, and the math is the number of prospects times your conversion rate is the number of customers. So if you had 100 prospects and your conversion rate is 10%, you'd end up with 10 customers. And so your goal is to drive conversions. You, the more of them you get, the better. So it becomes a problem, though, because suppose you're not getting that many conversions. Suppose 10% seems really low. The question is, what do I do next? And so because you have that problem where there's just one number, that is your conversion rate, what they do offline is they actually break down the sales process. So first, they take those prospects and they qualify them. They look at the list and they say, who are the people who are the most qualified, the people that we're most expecting to buy from us? Because they fit 
with the kinds of people who have bought from us before. But then you actually go and actively sell to those people. You're trying to call them, you're trying to approach them, set up a meeting, and then you get a bunch of people that you believe are going to be the most, you know, not just qualified, but they're, they're leads. And then those are become candidates. And those eventually get closed into customers. And so all along the way, there are these little mini conversion rates where they move from one step to the other. And that's really important that you be able to focus step to step. And why is that important? Because if things are not going well, what you want to understand is at what part of the process are they breaking? Where are the places that they're not going where you need them to go? You can do the same thing with your website or with any kind of digital marketing. So break it down into the steps. Now these aren't steps that you're taking, these are steps your clients are taking, your customers are taking. So they're becoming, they start as learners because they don't know anything about your products. Then they start shopping, then they eventually buy and become customers. And so you can pick out different steps on your website and isolate where people are and what they're doing. Now you can do more than just commerce. If you, if you have a website that also serves your customers after they buy, then you can break it up into those steps too. Maybe they're waiting to be shipped something, or maybe they come back and ask for help from you after they've made the purchase. All of those things are possible as well. So then what you want to do is to turn this into a closed loop. So it's one thing to look at whether people are learning about your products, whether they're actually shopping and comparing you against your competition, or whether now they've decided to buy, and now they're looking at things like shipping costs and how fast things will come. All those are important steps. But you also want to look at those get and use steps as well. And again, not every business is going to have the same steps. But the truth is that if you look at those steps, you turn them into a circle, all of those situations where people are coming back to your digital presence in order to learn about how to use things, so they're, they don't know how to use something and they have a question, those are all opportunities for you to get them to learn about something else. So when I worked at IBM, a lot of people came back to the website because they were having support questions. Their, their computer is now running slower than it used to. That's an opportunity to get them to learn about things they can do to speed up their computer, of which some of them are to buy something else, buy a little more memory, buy a whole new computer. All of those use questions, some of them have simple, straightforward answers of things people could do, but others are opportunities to get them to learn so that they buy something else. And so this helps you look at the whole relationship with your client and your customer. And so those are the things that you need to focus on. But you might ask, what does it have to do with search? Or what does it have to do with social media? What does it have to do with any other kind of digital marketing? And what we really want to focus on is what your conversions are. So you don't have a website up there just to show people things. Now, most people don't have a shopping cart on their site. If you do, this stuff can be very simple for you. Because having a shopping cart makes it really easy because you know exactly what you're trying to get people to do. You don't have to ask yourself. You're trying to get them to put things in the card and check out. And so everything you do on the site is designed to get people to do that. But most companies sell offline. And so what are they trying to get people to do? That's the answer to the question that you need. So are you trying to get them to find a store? Are you trying to get them to call you up or to fill out a contact form so you get their email address? When I was at IBM, one of the things that we had them do all the time was to download a white paper. Now, I don't know why they never used any other color paper, but they didn't. And so why did we want them to download a white paper? Because that white paper was full of information about that product or service. And what we knew is that 4% of the people who downloaded the white paper bought $50,000 worth of consulting. So what was it worth to IBM to get someone to download that white paper? That's right, it was worth 4% of $50,000 every time they did that. Because they knew if 100 people downloaded the white paper, four people were gonna spend $50,000. So getting so that's $200,000 to get 100 people to download the white paper. And so that's how they managed the business. So everything about that website was to try to get you to download a white paper. And that's how you have to design your website too. Focus on what you're trying to get people to do and then design your site to let them do it. 
Now, I know a lot of people went into marketing as a refuge from math, but unfortunately the math has found you. So you don't necessarily have to be the one doing the calculations, but you do have to be willing to make decisions based on the calculations. So let's look at what that math is. So if you take a very simple site that gets 1,000 visitors a day or 1,000 visitors a month or whatever time period you want to measure, and you have a 1% conversion rate, that's great. You have 10 conversions. Now, you could increase your conversion rate. Suppose you make your site twice as persuasive or you lower your prices or you do whatever you need to do so that you're getting 2%, double, the number of people to convert. That's great. Now you have 20 conversions. The other thing you can do is you can get more people to come. Suppose you double the number of people coming to your website. You haven't done anything in the website at all. You still have that pokey 1% conversion rate. But if you double the number of people coming, then you still double your conversions. Best of all is when you do both. So if you double the number of people coming and you double your conversion rate, now you've quadrupled your conversions. This is excellent. And now, now what you have to think about is everything that you do in digital marketing has to be designed to do one or the other of these or both. So if you're doing search marketing, it's because you're trying to get people to come to your site. If you're doing testing on your website to make it more persuasive, you're trying to get more people to buy. Everything you're doing in marketing is either getting more people to buy of those who come or it's getting more people to come. So we looked at the conversion rate and we said, hey, the conversion rate is the number of visitors divided by the number of sales. Right? So, so how do you figure that out? So, so do you really use visitors? Well, Toyota should because if somebody comes to their site five times, they're only buying one car. But Amazon shouldn't divide by visitors. They should divide by visits. So they should say they should use visits instead of visitors. And the reason is because someone could come to Amazon every day and buy something. And so think about the kind of business you are. If you're if you're a kind of business where people come multiple times to buy one thing, that's then you want to divide by visitors. But if they buy something every time they visit, then you want to divide by visits. You might be asking yourself, so how do I keep score? How do I count conversions? So you may already have a web metrics or analytics program on your site. If you do, that's great. If not, then here's a free one, Google Analytics. Go figure out how to get it installed, and then you, it will show you every day how many people are coming to your site and how many people are converting. So now you have to ask yourself, what is your cycle? So is your cycle to be able to do something completely online, like with PC sales? So if you're Dell Computer, Everything happens online. On the other hand, you might be a consulting company. And if you do that, then there are a couple of steps that the client does online. But then offline, they select from maybe from an RFP or something. Then they actually get the consulting offline. And while the consultant's there, they're constantly talking about new opportunities that might get them to come back to the website to learn some more. So if you have a site that leads to offline activity, you have to know how you're going to count those too. So how do you track those offline conversions? So there's a lot of different ways. Maybe you're going to have people print out a coupon to bring to the store. Or maybe you're going to put a phone number on your site that every time people call it, you know they came from the website. Or maybe you'll do this. Here's the car companies. What are they doing? Car manufacturers have no idea who walks into a dealer. They don't know they came from their website. So what they do, they put together this thing that allows you to build your own car. And then you print it out, and you walk into the dealer, and then the dealer writes down that you that you printed this out. And so if they sell you a car, they know you actually became an offline sale that started at the website. So how do those calls to action work? So they choose what they want, they print it out, or they have other conversions that they can do here. So Cadillac is thinking about its conversions when it designs its website, and these are the things it's counting to find out if its web marketing is effective. And you might say to yourself, well, I can't track offline, though. I just don't know how to do it. And so if you don't know how to do it, that's OK. Come up with a surrogate. So when customers buy, ask them how they found out about you. Put a question on your warranty cards. Do a survey. It doesn't matter what you do. Come up with something that helps you link your offline sales to your online activity. And then you want to ask yourself maybe what brings people to your site. Because you don't want to just know that your website's effective. You want to know what is the thing that actually brought them to the website. And so that's actually what we're going to talk about next month. Right? So any of these things could bring someone to your website. How do you know which ones are working and how do you not? And so there could be all sorts of things to bring to the website. Next month we're going to talk about social media. We're going to talk about Twitter, Google. 
We're going to talk about online reviews, blogs, video. How do you measure the return on investment for social media? That's going to be next month, April 19th, the same time of day. You can sign up now. If, you, if this webinar was good for you, then next month will be too. This, next month will build on this month by telling you how you can track all of your different social media and how you can focus on letting, and letting the social media tracking tell you which things are working. So um, I know that this can be like a roller coaster ride that comes to a stop, but I hope that we've got some good questions queued up. And Frank, let me know, who, let me know what kinds of things people want to know. We've got a few minutes left, and I'm happy to tackle whatever's on people's mind. Sure. Thanks, Mike. I'm sure our attendees have a much stronger idea of how to apply uh, direct marketing principles to uh, digital marketing. But uh, you didn't answer every question. Although I'm pretty sure you think you did, right? Uh, <laughs> I always think that. <laughs> <laughs> I've got several good questions from our audience teed up for you. Um, I'd just like to remind the audience now that it's not too late to ask your own question. You can type it into the questions box, and um, and you go to webinar controls. And our first question comes from uh, comes from Linda. She's asking, is there any difference between doing this as a, uh, a somebody who's in a B2B space? versus the B2C space, you know, business to business versus business to consumer, is, you know, what are the differences? Are there any nuances? There aren't any differences that are absolutely stark lines between B2B and B2C. Where the real changes come in is whether you're doing things totally online or totally offline, which we talked about in the presentation. But the other area that really, really makes a big difference is when we're talking about the difference between a purchase on Amazon and a purchase of a car, for example, from Toyota. So you have to think clearly about whether the purchase that is being considered is one that is what they call a high consideration purchase. So it's something where you don't do it very often. You have to think it through really clearly. You spend time researching, thinking, and trying to understand it or whether it's something that is a very quick decision. The diff now, a lot of times, B2B is one of those high consideration purchases. And so people a lot of times lump B2B and B2C as being, being high. And what they're really talking about is high consideration and low consideration. So low consideration purchases, like, like going to Amazon and buying a book, that's a low consideration purchase. But the truth is that there are many low consideration purchases in B2B. Um, if you're selling supplies, like Staples sells mostly to businesses. People don't know this, but Staples sells mostly to businesses. So most of Staples' business is B2B. But they're pretty low consideration purchases for the most part. If you're, trying, if you're picking up more supplies of Post-it notes, or you need more ink cartridges for your printer, those are very low consideration purchases. On the other hand, if you're going to Staples to buy furniture, uh, office furniture, that's a high consideration purchase. You're going to be looking at that. You're going to be thinking about it. You don't do it very often. It's expensive. It's much riskier. So it's really a question of the risk of the purchase and how frequently you do it. Those are the things that are different. And now a lot of times B2B purchases are those high consideration purchases. I mean, if you run a consulting firm like we were talking about, then almost every purchase is a high consideration purchase. The people don't do it very often. It's very customized. It's not the kind of thing that they are experts in. They never get really good at it. But there are plenty of high consideration purchases in B2C as well. Um, if you have to buy a car, that's a high consideration purchase. If you're purchasing life insurance, that's a high consideration purchase. So, there, so it's not, to me, mostly the difference between B2B and B2C. It's the difference between high consideration risky purchases and low consideration purchases. Okay, great. Thanks, Mike. Uh, we actually have a question from Bill, and he's wondering if we could, if you would even go back of one slide about the different uh, landing opportunities. That I think this is the one he means. Yeah, and I guess uh, I guess this is just to take a look at it, and, and to uh, you know, I didn't see any any additional part of that question from Bill, but to take a look at these that can be measured. Uh, we can get this information, and we're going to be sending everybody a link regarding this. So uh, you can get this information from us after the uh, after the um, webinar. Right, you'll get a recording that has all of these slides in it. It'll it'll be um, you know kind of like a slide share type thing where uh, my voiceover will be in it, and uh, you'll see all the slides. And so 
I mean, just to go a little deeper on this slide, this slide lists a whole bunch of things that you could do that would cause people to come to your website. And so, you know, the ones that I have on the arrows are all social media items, and those are the kinds of things we'll talk about next week to find out how can you track that someone coming to your site came from social media. But all these other things are things that can cause people to come to your site as well. And so if you're trying to identify which things are providing the most return on investment, so which of your marketing tactics are the things that um, you the most bang for the buck, you have to know how to identify each visitor who comes to the site based on how they came. And so that's a critical part of being able to adjust your marketing mix. So when you look at all these tactics and you're trying to decide how much of one should we do, how much of the other should we do, the only way you're going to be able to figure that out besides guesswork is to identify visitors coming to the site as having come from one of these marketing tactics. And so next month in the webinar, we're going to talk about how you can identify people who come from social media. Okay, great. Um, there's one other quick question. Do you, you want to try one more, Mike? Wanna... Sure. Yeah, this is uh, it's a little bit off, and it's probably going to be addressed next month, but somebody's talking about, you know, sometimes they feel it's difficult to, uh, looks like it's difficult to get traffic to come to their site, and it may not, you know, search may not be working like they want, or, or whatever, or, you know, it could be competitive. And they're wondering how you feel about the, uh, you know, bringing people to your business um, uh, through Groupon or Living Social or something that's a daily deal kind of uh, thinking. What's your, what's your take on that? Any of those things could be good. Um, what you need to do is to test them. Um, for any particular business, um, the, understanding what kinds of things work. You know, we talked in direct marketing how you have to experiment, you have to try different things. And so it's not just enough to say, well, we tried search and it didn't work. You may need to try a number of different things in order to get search to work. And the same thing could happen with Groupon. You could say, okay, we tried Groupon and it didn't work, but how many times did you try it? How many different ways did you change the way you were trying it? That's that experimental approach that we're talking about. This is what direct marketers understand. They just they don't send out that one letter and say, oh, well, that letter didn't work. Let's not send letters out anymore. What they do is they test many, many different versions of their materials until they get one that they know is working, and then they go big with that. And so this is the same kind of approach that we have to take in digital marketing. So understand those direct marketing principles. They will really serve you. And so it's not so much a question of which things should I try. It's a question of how much of a try you're going to give it, how creative are you going to be about what you do, and how are you going to measure which ones are working and which ones aren't so that you know what to repeat and improve on in the future. Fantastic. Uh, well, to be respectful of everyone's time, one of the things we want to try and do is to make this a, a quick uh, quick part of your day so you can get a lot of information and move on and get get back to your business. So uh, we're going to be wrapping up right now. I just want to say thanks to Mike for his great ideas, and uh, thanks especially to our audience for your participation and your questions. Um, if you had any questions that you didn't have time to answer, you can email your question to Eileen. That's E I L. E E N at Mike Moran Group .com, and she'll be sure to get them the mic for the answer. Um, later this week, we'll be sending you a link to the recording of the webinar to listen to again and to share with others. And um, also invite you to mark your calendars for our next Technology webinar, which is tracking social media ROI, scheduled for 11 a.m. Um, Eastern Time in the U.S. on April 19th. So thank you, everyone. I hope you have a great day. <laughs>